He is one of the hosts of the Celtics Lab podcast and a managing editor of the Celtics Wire. We welcome Dr. Justin Quinn onto Hoopsology. How's it going, Justin? It's going pretty well. How about y'all? Doing really well. And man, oh man, it's, it's been quite the week for the Boston Celtics. Um, so full disclosure, uh, my dad's from the Boston area. He's a huge Celtics fan. And he's a huge Celtics fan, but like he doesn't understand kind of the um, minutia of what's goes on day to day with a team. So for somebody who's like a casual kind of follower, like my dad is, can you kind of break down basically as best you can from like the Celtics, basically from the bubble to where they progress now in terms of um, them being eliminated from the playoffs. So bringing up the bubble, I think is a great jumping off point to understanding the Celtics in the situation that they're in now. And I say that because more than any other team, they have been affected by the coronavirus. I think they were more than 20 game, like man games lost than any other team. And as a result of that, and just, you know, general roster turnover, the lack of time to practice because of the condensed season caused by the pandemic hiatus, it's been a hot mess of a season. You can look at all four of the teams that were left in the conference finals last season in the bubble, and all four of them have been dealing with some fairly substantial injury issues. And for Boston in particular, when you combine that with with, uh, the COVID-19 absences, the roster turnover, and really, and we'll get to this, I'm sure, um, the missteps of the front office, particularly, I guess we're going to lay the blame at the feet of Danny Ainge, the... The cascading effect of all of this was a wildly underperforming season that left a very bitter taste in a lot of Celtics fans' mouths for good reason. Sure. And can you just go over the the toll that this took on Brad Stevens in particular? Just because I've heard just a lot of analysts said, like, mentally, uh, I think even her Jackie McMullen even um, referred to it as this is the, the wear and tear of what she described of that short time span between the bubble and this, this current season here um, kind of took on a toll on him mentally. So I want to kind of ask you if you have any insight regarding that. And then also maybe jumping the gun, him just being the, the, the president of basketball operations, is that going to really help him? Just, just forget the basketball, just as a human being. Like this is a wise thing for him to do as just a person. You just take a break <laughs> just to kind of disperse I have my misgivings. Uh, I do think that people are underestimating – the skill set of coaching, particularly a, a former college coach, in terms of program building. I mean, that's basically you are both coach and GM as a college um, program head. And he built Butler into a fairly substantial collegiate fixture in his time there. It wasn't a particularly long amount of time there either. It wasn't like the Jim Calhouns, for example, to go where I know in college basketball with decades of time to build a program into a juggernaut. He did it very quickly. So I think there is something there. Um, He knows the system. Management trusts him. And as people have pointed out with probably at least a small grain of truth to it, uh, they just extended him for, I think, six more seasons, and that's a lot of money (laughs) that you would be throwing in the toilet if you just completely cleaned house, to say nothing of the aforementioned continuity issues Um, As far as the the human element with Brad, you know, he has been the picture of grace throughout the pandemic. He's always said the right things in press conferences, except for very recently. It was very clear that he got tired of answering the same questions all the time about why the players weren't responding, what was going to change, what he was going to do different. And to be completely honest, he, he didn't really have that much that he could do. Again, for the, the, the same reasons that we talked about in terms of there's no time, there's no practice time in order to reorient your, your organization when you, for example, make major moves at the trade deadline. There was a very awkward, shall we say, roster construction with too many guys in the front court needing minutes whose reputation kind of demanded it in terms of Tristan Thompson. Um with Robert Williams starting to blossom into like a high value player at exactly the right slash wrong time, depending on what we're talking about. And the, the, the situation ended up being untenable for Stevens in that he, he kind of had to just juggle minutes 
among players that required him to put very awkward and non-modern double big lineups on the floor for extended periods of time. That in turn really demolished, you know, the cornerstone of a, of a Brad Stevens team has always been defense. And there was basically no, no high level NBA defense to speak of this season, other than at moments when they actually would communicate and work together. Part of the dog in the background, Mexico city. We have lots of them here. Um, and it really seemed to take a toll on Stevens over the course of the season in pressers. Uh, he became increasingly flat <laughs> uh, and disanimated in his conversations with us. And it was very evident. I, I definitely believe that those reports that we're hearing that he had some trouble um, staying motivated, staying up for the challenge um, were significant. And I think a, a not small part of that relates to just the cascading effects of Danny Ainge losing people each season, major, major uh, free agents each season for the last three seasons and scrambling to try to like fill those holes once all the big pieces and important moves had already been made on the trade deadline or excuse me, the trade deadline, the free agency market. So the, the, the combined effect of all these things coalesced to just produce an utterly disheartening experience for pretty much everybody involved, fans included. Yeah, it's it's kind of odd, Justin, that, um, you know, there's there's kind of this big reset going on, of course, in Boston after a season that, in my opinion, and, and from the data that we know regarding, you know, absences from COVID games, things like that, it seems a, a very, if, if there's going to be any season that you kind of just don't judge <laughs> and try to move in, uh, you know, given the injury at the end of the year to Jalen Brown, even, and then the, um, you know, the record during the season of, I think in large part to those missed games um, seems really hard to judge this team. So I guess my question would be, how do you judge this team moving forward? And uh, specifically with Tatum and Jalen Brown, can, can these two guys, still in in your eyes be the foundation for this team um how, how much more help do they need or around them i mean clearly more so than this year but but again how do we evaluate that well i think the biggest thing in terms of those two as the cornerstones moving forward there's been some pressure to to split them up uh in some corners i really don't get that because they are both easily top 50 players and arguably top 20 players those are the people you want on your team. And some people say, well, you know, they, they don't, they don't necessarily move the ball very well. They are, I believe 24 and 23 or 22. Um, they're very young and they have developed skills. We have seen Tatum take on basically point forward skills this season. He hasn't polished into a T yet, but I mean, it was something he kind of picked up along the season due to, again, lack of any real ball movers, uh, distributors on this, this roster. Kemba, Kemba Walker is their starting point guard. Um, and he's been kind of miscast in this kind of like off ball slash distributor role that he is neither of. He is a score first point guard. He always has been. And he might work well in a tandem, but he's definitely not going to function very well as part of a three headed snake. We have three, elite finishers and no distribution. So is it any wonder that, that this game, this team is not winning games when they are, they are passing the ball like 19 times, 20 times a game compared to other teams, 26, 27, 28 times per game. It just, there are a lot of things that you need to take into account. And all of these things tend to make an average basketball fan's eyes go into the back of their head. Cause it's just overwhelming. And if you think it's overwhelming to hear about in a few minutes of conversation, imagine going through an entire season, showing up to work, not having the parts. It's like trying to drive in an Indy 500 race with a car donut. You know, like it's going, but it's, this is not how it's supposed to be going. Right. <laughs> Got you. And, and you mentioned Kemba Walker. So I, I have to ask in this off season, is it, is it one of the Celtics major priorities to move him? Do you think, or do you think, um, I mean, obviously it always depends on the offer, what you can get back in return, but do you think it's a priority for them to try and reconfigure that three headed monster, so to speak? I do think that we have determined 
at this point that the Jays have enough scoring, particularly if you can clean up some of the depth issues that resulted from Danny Ainge probably hanging on to a too few many guys too long. There's something to be said for giving uh, fairly competent but underperforming rookies and guys on the rookie contract some rope. But the situation, again, like he has two-way players with no G League season. How are they supposed to get better? They never get on the floor unless it's a disaster, and they didn't have time to practice with the team. So in terms of a developmental standpoint, it was probably just a terrible plan to begin with to have a bunch of guys who needed time to develop but could never get the time to play because of how the roster was put together and because of the exigencies of the season. So there, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, in terms of Kemba's future with the team, I do think you're right that if a deal that comes along that makes sense to get off of most or all of his salary – uh, without expending more than a single draft pick, I think there's a very good chance they're going to take it. And it's not because I think Kemba is being seen through a very negative light of late. And I think that if you get him on a team that doesn't necessarily have title aspirations and is mostly just looking to have some butts and seats, I think that he can be a very useful player. He can help middle of the pack teams win games and he can definitely help teams that uh, are not doing so great uh, lose them because while he can be, I think still like a 25 point plus per game score in the right situation. I don't think that he is a good fit for a team that, you know, needs to play the half court to go deep in the playoffs where his game is mostly as a single one man show kind of transition score. Justin, I want to shift gears and focus on the the head coaching search. Um, now, I think in this day and age, there is a new element as we've seen the rise of you know women's coaches um, and within the NBA itself, and just been clamoring from media um, journalists and just fans to consider um, you know the names of like Becky Hammond and um, Kara Lawson. Um, for this coach, it's kind of a weird situation because Brad Stevens has to pick his successor, so to speak. So I, I guess I want to ask, like, what do you think he's looking for in this role? And do you think realistically the names that have been tossed around, like Kara Lawson, like, you know, Becky Hammond, or even a Sam Cassell or a Chauncey Phillips, is that realistic? Like, what, I guess, perception in terms of people that don't necessarily follow the Celtics to compared to yourself, you're around this team all the time. Like, what is Brad Stevens actually looking for? And do you think, like, somebody like Jay Laranaga, who's the assistant coach, is he, like, number one and actually is probably going to be the successor in line? Well, as far as what the Celtics want in that regard, if you remember how we ended up with Brad Stevens, there were no clues whatsoever. Just suddenly out of the blue – we all found out there was going to be a press conference and that we needed to uh, cover this guy out of Butler. I mean, we knew who, who Brad was, but there was zero information connecting him to the Celtics. So I would not be surprised if the person who actually does get the job is a candidate like that. Uh, I'm not, you know, like this is not based on any kind of information, but like we haven't heard anything, for example, about Mike D'Antoni or David Fisdale or someone like that. It could very well be someone who just pops out of the work and blows our mind with the unlikeliness and unconnectedness um, of that particular person compared to the, the national narrative. I have my doubts it's going to be someone internal. Um, I would think if it was going to be anyone, my instinct tells me it would actually be Jerome Allen because he connects with the players. And the biggest advantage uh, besides, you know, again, continuity, which is something that the Celtics do – um, really put a lot of value in. I don't necessarily think they want continuity that isn't going to motivate the players. I would think that Jerome Allen has a pretty good claim on that based of the three. Also, Scott Morrison being another example of the in-house candidates. I think that Carl Lawson um, is actually one of the most interesting um, candidates out there in that 
It would be a surprise if she left Duke, but she also seems to have been very good at motivating at least some of the younger players that she was working with. Um, I can't speak to her relationship with the team because A, Mexico City, and B, pandemic reporting. Uh, it doesn't really engender any kind of ability to watch these people working together. So you, it's hard to get a feel uh, for what kind of a relationship they actually did have. If I were to say there were a likely out of out of house candidate out there. I actually don't know if Billups or um, Cassell are are necessarily in in the lead. I think actually someone like Udoka or maybe you know because he has a, a relationship with both Jalen excuse me Jalen Brown and um, and Stevens himself is Lloyd Pierce from the Atlanta Hawks. He seems to be someone who even though he hasn't proven, which is a bit of an issue. I'll get to that in a second. In the right circumstances, I could see them taking a chance on someone like him or Udoka or Becky Hammond, though I don't think she's going to leave San Antonio. I kind of have the feeling that she is the heir apparent there for when Pop, uh, when Pop moves on. Um, but back to the thing about what they are planning. If they are planning to try to retool on the fly and get right back into the thick of things, which there's a very good argument not to, then I could see them taking a chance on someone with a little bit more high caliber name, pr pursuing somebody like maybe Terry Stotts or, or maybe someone like, again, Dan Tony, not that he's been connected officially in any capacity. If they choose to kind of let the younger players still in the roster, they plan on keeping presumably Neesmith, Pritchard, um, Romeo Langford, um, those kinds of guys. If they if they want to develop those guys, try to build up a little bit of value to combine with the picks and then get the third star to go next to the, uh, the Jays, then I think they would be more willing to take a chance on someone who doesn't have any kind of head coaching or at least extensive head coaching skills. Justin, I, I have to follow up and ask, you know, you mentioned there being a good case for maybe not pushing towards like a, like a title run or a hard push next year. Can you give us kind of the both sides of it. I mean, I guess just from my view as the outsider looking in, you know, you've got Tatum who's had the taste of some playoff ex uh, success as well as Jalen Brown. And you want to keep those guys on the roster, of course, and keep them happy, keep them, you know, not pushing for trades down the road or things like that. What What's kind of the argument both ways for where you should take this team next year? how much money the ownership group is willing to spend and who they can manage to get on the roster to pay. So Jason Tatum is going to have his extension kick in next season. And I'm not, I can't remember exactly how much money it is, but it's going to be less than $10 million away from the apron. Uh, once they have no other of uh, their free agents um, taken care of and None of the spots, there's going, they're going to have like six or seven or eight spots open, opening up. And they're going to have to basically, if they do any kind of a sign-in trade to bring anybody on, then it's going to become virtually impossible for them to staff the roster. So that means that any kind of significant, um, how shall we say, well, there's a couple of key things. Whether you can move Kemba, and it's roughly $36, $37 million worth of salary, whether or not you can re-sign Evan Fournier, what you're going to do with that $11 million trade, traded player exception that's left over, uh, whether or not you're going to generate one with the departure of Fournier, assuming that all parties are so inclined to let happen. There's less of a relationship with Fournier, so that may not happen. But if you're talking to the team and you say, uh, here's a free draft pick, a second round draft pick, just uh, sign different paperwork, it can be pretty convincing. But then again, you're also burning assets. In short, there's a lot of moving parts. And if you can't get the right kind of players on the roster now. If you if you can't move Kemba for less than a draft pick to a, a situation that brings you back something you can work with, if the other parts don't line up, then you might be in a situation where it's better just to kick the can down the road, not bring on any long-term contracts, not commit yourself to second-rate, third-rate stars that aren't going to get the job done and really contend against the likes of, look at what we are seeing, like these historic levels of offense from the Brooklyn Nets. I do think that there is a realm where you can get that third guy that you could compete against them, but not with... I don't know. I don't want to insult any particular NBA player, but we'll just say a B-list star. 
uh, Justin, I wanted to ask you, what do you think um, Danny Ainge's legacy um, is with this team? Obviously, he got them a championship. Um, he was able to – he's known for his wheeling and dealing and now really setting up this franchise with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Where do you think his, his legacy is going to be um, when we look back you know, 20 years from now? Is it going to be a little bit sour just due to the kind of the recent um, just – I guess results from the Boston Celtics, even though they've been a perennial power, I think most you know wanted them to at least you know be in the finals or at least you know win a couple of championships with this new um, era of this team. But yet the, the Celtics are pretty set up, and they are a perennial Eastern Conference power. So, what do you think overall, Danny Ainge is uh, legacy going to be on this team? You know, I think that there has been some recency bias that it, it will be a slightly tarnished record. But I think when you look back at what he was able to do with a fairly surprising start to his, his tenure in being able to drag two Hall of Famers into Boston with what at the time looked like a very, very good um, deal to get um, Ray Allen and Kevin Garnett into into Boston. I think that it's very hard to be a general manager successfully for even five years in the NBA and to have done it for nearly 20 off of really having the, the patience to tear down what was a apparently successful team. I'm talking the Pearson, uh, Antoine Walker uh, teams when he first got to Boston. He had the the foresight to see that they weren't going to quite get to where he needed to, to get them to, to meet the standards of what the Celtics public would want. And he was very aggressive and very bold early on and kind of set the entire stage for building teams um, through trades in the modern NBA. Now, in the last couple of years, and I hinted about this earlier, he, okay, so my personal vision is actually on, on how to build championship teams is actually based on how he started his regime in Boston and that you aggressively try to get that elite star talent on the roster at all costs. It doesn't matter what you have to move to get it on the roster. You just need to get it on your roster and you need to trade it before it either becomes too unvaluable to get a good return from it or before it can walk out the door. Now, that is my own take, that last bit. That is not a Danny Ainge thing, clearly, because, you know, at the time of the Kyrie Irving uh, decampment, I understood everything. I thought there was a pretty good chance that they were going to be able to resign him to there. There were some pretty clear signs that they weren't. That said... Once you roll around to the Al Horford and the Gordon Hayward free agencies, there were quite a few people, myself included, agitating for trading him. Not because we wanted to see either of those players go. I love Al Horford. I really loved having Gordon Hayward on this team. They were amazing. But we saw what happened. And you don't just lose the, the player when they walk out the door. You also lose the time to replace them, as we see by – basically signing um, Tristan Thompson and uh, the corpse of Jeff Teague in free agency. No offense, Jeff, but you have not been what you were. Um, in a nutshell, that is going to be lingering in people's minds for quite some time. But I think when you look back at the, the previous 15 or so years before that, he did quite a bit with quite little input to begin with. He, he was a Overall, I think a positive uh, general manager with some moments of real brilliance, the Jason Tatum trade, for example, trading back uh, from Mark L. Fultz to, to pick up Jason Tatum and getting a whole other draft pick that is Romeo Langford. And like, yes, Romeo Langford is not a superstar or even, you know, necessarily much more than a low rotation player, but he got that for nothing. It's not easy to do. Absolutely. Justin, I, I have to ask, and I'm sorry if this sounds too like ESPN first take or sports radio ish, but let, let's say Danny Hange gets one mulligan uh, given just the last five plus years or so. Do you think he still makes the Isaiah Thomas trade, um, you know, 10 times out of 10 if he's given a mulligan on that? Well, asking you to you put know, on your Danny Hange hat here. <laughs> Danny Hange would, would tell you in a heartbeat that he would do it every time. And 
for basketball reasons, there are very sound reasons for doing it. However, I've since come around to the, the possibility that you don't always have to necessarily squeeze every inch of value out of it and retaining the assets. And of course, this is Monday morning quarterbacking to the extreme here because we know what, what ended up coming from the draft pick. Uh, sure. I think it was, it was, was it Garland or Sexton? It was one of the two for Cleveland ended up being taken from that draft. And I mean, in either case, um, that would be an awfully nice player to have on Boston's roster right now. And yes, it would have set back Boston's rebuild, but Boston's rebuild was already several years ahead of what people anticipated it being through the found gold that was the Isaiah Thomas trade. I don't think that any of the parties harbor any particular will, ill will towards each other other than perhaps Isaiah Thomas towards the medical staff who incidentally, without necessarily any explanation coming from the organization or in particular, were let go after a very long time with the team, basically my whole adult life. Wow. So yeah. there may be something to that uh, based on this recent recent rumbles we're hearing from Isaiah Thomas that he was given the go-ahead with the understanding that it would just be um, painful for him rather than, you know, effectively career-ending. Mm. But as far as if you have an injured player on your roster and their contract is up, you don't sign them to a max contract. You do not do that. And if you can get value for them – by moving them in you know, a sign-and-trade deal for an elite player like Kyrie Irving, then you do that almost every time. You know There is, as I pointed out, an argument that you might be, have been able to find your way into a better situation knowing what we know now about Kyrie Irving, but it's very hard to look at that kind of talent and say, hmm, we can make it work. Um, Justin, I wanted to ask about the, the Boston Celtics fans. Um, there's just been a lot put out there, not only through just the recent fan incidents, but also um, the comments made by Kyrie Irving and I think Kevin Durant too, was just in general throughout the years about playing in Boston. And I, I, I wanted to ask you, even though you're, you're based in, in Mexico City, you, you still cover this team uh, fairly closely. I wanted to ask you, are there any misconceptions you think of the Boston fan base that I think the national media kind of um i guess paints a broad but a brush and they don't really know what the fan base is truly about or do you think what people say about them is actually true and what 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 are people both perspectives are right both perspectives are right okay and i say that because as we have seen very clearly particularly recently Poor fan behavior in a context that can easily and probably should be cast in a racially insensitive light. Uh, Even when people aren't using racial epithets, for example, happen all over the country. They've been happening all over the country. People pouring popcorn on players of color is not a non-racist act. Demeaning athletes and not treating them like human beings is not a non-racist act. There may not be overt racism in the minds of people are like, I I don't like this person because of the color of his skin, but it is very, very hard to take a majority African American league and take historically disrespectful behavior by majority white audiences and not take that away from it. Now it's also true that the Celtics organization has for its entire history and certainly recently been incredibly active in combating both overt and systemic racism in particular. Uh, Boston, for example, happens to be the new home of Ibram Kendi's um, anti-racist institute, which is kind of a big deal, you know? I mean, but there is also a fair argument to say that it is a city that is exceptionalist. It, because it is the home of a lot of higher learning, tends to think of itself as above things like racism. And, Frankly speaking, even members of the Boston Celtics during that controversy really managed to put some egg on their faces by saying the one thing that you should never, ever say when someone talks about experiencing racism, which is, I haven't seen that. It's not about you. It's about the experience of someone who is brave enough to tell you about what they have experienced because they didn't have to tell you and they have plenty of good reasons not to. Don't say that. Never say that. It's not about you. The thing to say, particularly when you are, for example, a 
well-known broadcaster for ESPN or the general manager of a team, not naming any names, uh, the thing to say is not, I have never seen that in my time in Boston because there's lots of reasons that that could happen, particularly if you are, for example, an old, wealthier white guy who isn't necessarily next to the types of fans that get really drunk and say really nasty things. It's quite possible that if you are a huge mountain of a man, people are never going to say anything racist near you because they are afraid you will take them to pieces. So those are just two very obvious examples about why you might not have experienced it. There are very obvious examples that both of those people who I've been dancing around, but I'll just be very open about this. It's Ainge and Kendrick Perkins. Marcus Smart published an article in the Players' Tribune detailing his very, very overt experiences of racism as a currently tenured Boston Celtic. And so if you are not aware of that, if you are not aware of the types of racism that are being discussed by historic and current players in your organization, maybe it is time to step down. You know, I don't necessarily think that is why, for example, Danny Ainge stepped down, but it didn't sound to me like he was particularly committed to the, the organizational inertia of the Boston Celtics responding in a way that doesn't just defuse the acts that Jalen Brown was very careful to cast a little bit of shade on without discounting. The timing sure certainly seemed weird to a lot of Celtics fans of what Kyrie said when he said it. But you have to be a fool living with your head in the sand to not understand that there are examples. I mean, Tristan Thompson confirmed that while he never experienced it as a Celtic, he saw it as a visiting member of, of another team. So I don't know. In, in some, uh, I think that the way forward is how Brad Stevens – handled uh, the same words, which is basically we should take that kind of stuff very seriously. And I would hope that our fan base is above that. You know, that's all you can do. You can't control 17, 18,000 people. So you just have to try to do your best to set the culture and take things seriously by not bringing up your anecdotal experiences. Well, Justin, it, it was awesome having you on the show. Um, really appreciate it. Please let our listeners and viewers know where to find you on social media and also what else you're working on for the rest of this year as well. So at this point of the season uh, with the Celtics eliminated, you can see some player analysis of how the Celtics had done with a really horrible set of circumstances. It's going to be very uplifting. I'm sure you'll all love it. But if you want something that isn't going to make you depressed and uh, reminiscent of some of the worst times of perhaps all of our lives, uh, not just as fans, but in general, I'm really selling this, aren't I? Uh, <laughs> there, <laughs> there, there's uh, the, the 2021 draft coming up. And while there's a very good chance that Boston is going to use its assets to move out of the draft entirely to pick up another player or consolidate the roster or who knows what, uh, I will be doing a lot of draft analysis moving forward as well. And you can find me at J-U-S-T-I-N-Q-U-I-N-N, three N's, at Twitter.com. Awesome, Justin. Well, thank you very much for joining the show. Really enjoyed your insight. Take care, man. <laughs>